program, we'd be more than happy to share that information with you electronically. Uh, so let's um, introduce uh, the panel by going through a couple of questions that we have. I'll address the questions to um, individual panelists and see uh, how we can start the uh, the conversation going on uh, Atlantic Canada. So, Kevin, um, international tourists to Atlantic Canada represent only 5% of the total international tourists to Canada. Um, doesn't seem like a big number, but what is the challenge really to increasing that level of tourism into Atlantic Canada? Thank you, John. Good, good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. Greetings from the other side of the Atlantic here today in uh, Lisbon, Portugal. John, I, I looked at some research um, about Canada in, in 2019, obviously 2020, forget it. We all know what's been happening there. And from, from Canada statistics, it was about 22 million international tourists visited Canada. It's been growing around 5% year on year. US represented around 15 million. Um, UK was the biggest rest of the world, followed by France. Out of that 22 million, you had around 1.5 million in the region of the Atlantic Canada, hence around 5 6% only. Now, why? And I think it's a very important question because what's, what is it about the other two thirds of the market that is not appearing in this region? Is it, is it connectivity? I mean, obviously, Halifax has flights coming in London. Paris, Dublin, Condor from Frankfurt, in the past Air Canada into St. John's. So there has been connections. Now, are they seasonal? So you're really working a couple of months of the summer. Obviously, you've got major connections into Montreal and Toronto. And does that then detract people from visiting Atlantic Canada? Um, how do you try to spin existing lift into the hubs and bring them over into this part of the region or do we start to think about how do we reconnect direct connectivity as the pandemic starts to unfold the industry is changing dramatically the hardware on aircraft the max the a321 long ranges etc could these provide great opportunities to increase that five percent of the canadian international tourism because it seems low as you rightly said and of course what is the attractions of the other parts of Canada that, that are benefiting and what's not Atlantic Canada delivering to turn potential lift into tourism I mean I was just just interesting this week I, I saw the American Air the American uh, Travel Agency Association the Automobile Association they call it AAA in their spring magazine, they had a very interesting article about Nova Scotia and particularly Cape Breton. So there is noise about the destination and there is noise about trying to increase the penetration of tourism into the Atlantic Canada. And how do we then try to instill connectivity to support that? So I think as a learning to straight away, yes, the numbers seem a little bit low compared to the other parts. The connections are there in some way, but how do we try and bring further connections beyond Halifax as an example? So I think we'll come back a little bit more and discuss that in detail, particularly on the European project. But I think generally at the moment, there does seem to be a slight worry about why is this region with so few international tourists, even if you take the US, the, you know, the, I think 87% of the tourists to the Atlantic Canada are from the US, but the US is only representing 8% of total US to Canada. So even it's 5% of the global Canadian tourism, it's only 8% from your neighbour. So, and there the opportunities must be even greater than bringing flights across the Atlantic. So I know Michael picked that up a little bit in terms of the local knowledge. So I think, you know, it's kind of, We've got to think the past, but look forward. And of course, this is about changing the third vision. So let's let's put the negative aside and let's look at where the opportunities are because 5% is too few and we can push that a lot higher. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any, any more comment or get already? 
Yes, absolutely. Yep, I have something to mention here. And um, there's a very good point here. When we look at, at network planning and, and accessibility and connectivity into the region, uh, we should ask ourselves uh, who's laying out the strategy of connectivity for the four provinces for Atlantic Canada. Is it the airlines or is it a joint effort between a strategic plan by the provinces to be able to connect uh, the provinces to that potential tourist in a more seamless way? And I'll go back to the fact that most of the connectivity we have into the region comes from, uh, from our own Canadian airliners and using a hub and spoke uh, system. Uh, when Gavin mentioned about the US, Back in uh, in the early 2000s uh, and mid 2000s, we had more lift in Atlantic Canada by US regional providers. We had uh, more nonstop. So something I want to leave here uh, as a pending or a thought or an idea for everybody is the fact that we're talking about inbound tourism, whether it's domestic or whether it's transborder or international. In order to be able to attract uh, any segment of tourism, we need to uh, think about the potential of having non-stop flights, more non-stop flights, or a one-stop connection in order to be able to focus on specific niche. Let's use an example. If you want to attract Chicago people during the fall, uh, sorry, during the spring to fall season of Atlantic Canada, how about uh, twice a week non-stop or a one-stop connectivity from a US carrier, a carrier that actually understands their own out bound market opportunity. Um, carriers from overseas have better uh, capabilities and more knowledge to send customers in the outbound. As Canadian carriers or as local carriers and anywhere in the world, we, we become very professional in outbound from our own country, but we not necessarily have the best expertise for inbound. And that's a, that's a, that's a statement that I leave out there and, uh, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate it. Uh, I think the next question I'm going to direct it to uh, to Renee, talking about you know regional regional airports and the regional airport marketing strategy. Uh, when trying to approach the airlines, what are the key elements of a successful airport marketing presentation that Atlantic Air, Atlantic Canada airports use? Renee. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity again and to participate in this uh, in this uh, session. I mean, first, you know, we need to define and, and I mean, there is there is one way to work together and that is to first define and teach those local market selling points, including demographics and, you know, every economics strength, you know, and all that. Secondly, you will have to look at uh, to present a detailed overview of the market in terms of current services, you know, traffic potential, traffic growth and what kind of airlines, you know, market share, you know, they have. Third, you will have to describe what is the strategic fit with the targeted airline network in terms of market size and growth, what is the opportunity, and what is the gap versus the, uh, the current services. Fourth, you will have to look as well into demand forecasting or what would be the expected in terms of passenger and cargo traffic uh, related to uh, to air airline service development, including even route p &L. You have to go down to that detail. And fifth, um, obviously, there's going to be a risk sharing strategy. For example, uh, route incentives, uh, you know, can move a route higher in the airline uh, agenda in their, in their flight planning department for um, when, when they're doing their evaluation. In, I mean, talking about these incentives are key for airlines these days, and they can take many forms, such as uh, guarantees, fees uh, per inbound uh, capacity, local marketing support, airport fee discounts, and other unidad, unilateral or co collaborative you know, uh, way of working. But at the very end, even though incentive, you know, can be in place, you know, the, the route will have to stand on its own to be a win-win for both parties. I mean, in a nutshell, if you are looking some sort of like a like a map of some sort of a chart in how to, uh, you know, to draw these, you will have to do a market assessment. That market assessment will include catchment area, market size, uh, potential, passenger mix, etc. You will have to do a route analysis that will include what is the contribution of that route 
of that route to, to that specific airline's uh, network. You will have to look into low factors, aircraft type, frequencies, market share, etc. You will have to put a business case as well, and then you will have to look into the route incentive and what are those cost offsetter, as I described before. So you know, airlines you know can potentially move your destination, your route, you know, up you know, to the top 20, to the top 10 uh, ones uh, that they might be looking at further in detail. So perhaps, you know, one thing is, that, you know, how much the market can generate in traffic, at what fare or at what yields, and how low enough cost they could operate that route. But finally, and besides that, obviously, there are a number of data sets that needs to be looked at. And this is very important for a tourism uh, perspective. Because obviously airlines and airports might probably be more data centric and savvy, but you know the data the data sets that you will have to look in order to put together a strong business case, which tourism boards and airports should be working together on an air service development plan will include obviously airline seat capacity. You will have to look into GDS, MIDT type of data. You will have to look into the destination economic and demographic data. Uh, you will have to look into immigration data. You will have to look into bookings, low factors, you know, average fare. What is the sentiment as well to travel to that destination? And you will have to obviously look into the other sectors of the industry. You will have to look into hotel occupancy rates, tourism data from the United Nations World uh, Tourism Organization and the, and the WTTC, and there are other associations, tourism associations that you will be looking at to look at data. So at the end, it's very important that everything that is done is done in a way that is uh, relevant, is current, and your numbers have to be conservative. That's the best way to position uh, your offer. Back Thank you, Greg. Great, thank you, Renee. I was always intrigued by you know trying to develop an international market program and an international air service to interesting destinations. And I think the example that sticks in the back of my mind is probably uh, a market called Frankfurt to Whitehorse. Now, who would have thought Frankfurt to Whitehorse would be an interesting? One? Now, well, Condor, Condor, flew Frankfurt to Whitehorse twice a week. And, you know, I, I would challenge anybody to really try to understand the data behind that service, that it really was, you know, some, you know, Condor took a chance, um, Condor built the market up and understood the, the desire of the German population to, in fact, you know, um, frequent Canada's north and, you know, put this service into place. It's very seasonal. It's twice a week. And, you know, from what I understood, the flights were, you know, pretty popular and they were, they were making contribution on doors bottom line. Um, so my thoughts would be, is there an opportunity, you know, for Atlantic Canada with its own individual markets to be able to kind of put together a, you know, a program that would be much more specific to markets that would have some type of connection, either tourist or cultural connection the Maritimes and basically focusing on getting um, either the domestic carriers, Air Canada, WestJet, or hopefully Transat will still be around, um, to see, or international carriers to basically operate, you know, one or twice, once or twice a week for 10 or 12 weeks and to basically present themselves as a growing element of the effort by Atlantic Canada to give itself an international position. Anybody want to comment on that? Can I can I jump in, John? Because on, on for sorry, Mike, and, but Condor I know well. Obviously, in my my role here in Portugal, they they're a very important player for the island of Madeira. So I speak quite frequently with Condor. I'll be honest, John. Condor is is an airline working with multiple tour operators, FTI, Schauensland, Der Touristic. Even Tui will be taking some seats. So, on your on your White Horse project, that is German tour operators taking allocations. And Condor is 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 basically re reacting to the demand coming from the market, and that is exactly what no this region Atlantic Canada needs to think about because Condor is doing Halifax. I've just checked now for you know this the listing in August, three flights a week still between Frankfurt and Halifax. So they're assuming that the German tour operators are going to be taking inventory on those flights. And if you if you look here in Europe at the moment, you know the tour operators have all all 
really struggling to guarantee lift in relation to supporting third party Acme flights. So, for instance, if, if Condor is able to put on air access and work with the tour operators and the destination works with those tour operators in the source market, what is stopping Condor looking at continuing Halifax? even thinking of opening up St. John's. It's getting the tour operators. And as Mike said, unfortunately, what, what Atlantic Canada has, other than Condor, the other three international routes are Canadian airline companies going in to Europe. Now, when I was with SATA, you know, APG was my GSA, and I know they have a GSA for WestJet, so I don't want to say anything wrong against <laughs> APG. But the reality is that the vision of Canada, Canada into Europe, not Europe into Canada. So the reality here is, you know, WestJet is a great opportunity, but it's how do you get it coming back? And that's where the, you know, other tour operators in, in UK working WestJet seats in the same way as the tour operators in Germany are working Condor seats because Condor is 100% working with tour operators. That's their job. That's their model. So I think Mike's point was so right about getting the European guys to look at flying into the region and not just focusing on the Canadian airline companies who are basically doing an outbound strategy to Europe. You want an inbound strategy to the destination. People like Jet2, which is a, an airline in the UK, now Jet2 Holidays, they have 757s. They could reach Nova Scotia. Is somebody talking to Jet2 Holidays in Leeds about programming up a destination? You know, you're not going to get Ryanair or EasyJet going into the region. The 737s and the A320s are not going to do it. But anybody would. And what about Transat? I mean, Transat has this project Canadian Affair in the UK. Could Transat do something the other way? to put people back into the region. So Mike's point is, is really valid. And what Condor has been able to do is really work the trade. And it's the trade that can then create the demand and not just focus on incentivizing supply. Nothing wrong paying an airline, but there's nothing worse than an airline coming with empty seats. We need demand generation. So sorry, Mike, if I jumped in, but the Condor is a really good project to think about and mirroring that into some of the other European destinations. Mike, go ahead. Yes, uh, just very briefly and in support uh, of this conversation here, and I'm very disruptive. So I don't like the 80 20. I don't like the 80 20 concept. Oh, we've been doing this for 20 years. We've been doing this for 30 years. And, and in, in the conversation, we just talk about Britain, England and France. We've been bringing customers from the same locations. Um, leader, uh, during, throughout the years, we bring customers and inbound tourism from some 10 top destinations where Destination Canada has representation or a tourism inbound. Let's go back to storytelling. We're in 2021. Canada and Atlantic Canada is a, is a story. Who are we going to tell that story? So uh, if you're following aviation recently and what's happening, a lot of airlines are suffering, governments are stepping in, but there's also a lot of fresh money going into new startups all over the world. So let's just use Europe for the sake of it and the fact that it's close to Atlantic Canada. There's right now three companies, three tour operators in Spain, but we have never done anything to bring Spaniards, which is a four hour, four, five hour flight into Atlantic Canada. Let's look at Portugal, where my friend Gavin is. And to my friends in Africa who are participating or the Middle East in this conversation. So we are in a pivotal time of aviation and tourism. Corporate, corporate travel might be down 20 or 40% in the next five years, according to some estimates. More people will be traveling for tourism, for leisure, looking for nature. Take a look what's happening in the US with the three big carriers right now. They have repositioned their aircrafts from their hope and spoke model to a P2P point to point service right now positioning the aircrafts during the pandemic. Could that be a trend towards the future? Could we open up to look at different ways of doing things? That's my question. And I think that, thank you, Mike. I think that question is gonna be one of you know, understanding, you know, is there a need to look at potentially consolidating, you know, the, the hubs or the point to points that we have in the Maritimes and to, to basically kind of focus in on one, two or three locations, airports that would have one, the capacity, the capability and would have the infrastructure to distribute inbound traffic to a variety of locations within Atlantic Canada. So if somebody decides to operate a service into St. John's 
or Deer Lake or Gander, you know, and then you want to move traffic to Moncton or Fredericton, you know, that could be a, you know, a challenge. And the question is, how would you do that? So, or would you bring direct flights into Moncton or Fredericton from, let's say, Frankfurt or Madrid or Zurich? And I think that, you know, those are the types of questions that, you know, we, we think need to be answered. And do we deal with the airlines? Do we deal with the tour operators? Do we, do we, do we deal with the consolidators? Try to you know raise those opportunities and try to build you know potential for new city pairs that you know probably are sitting in the back of people's minds. We really haven't done any effort to kind of convince the airline, basically take a chance on those markets and see what they can do. Yeah, if I can add a bit as well, I mean, consequently, I believe the region should be thinking about niche focus, remote and upper open air products. You, know, you have the case that uh, there was a news uh, this week that uh, an airline called Air Saint Pierre will start 737-700 flights between uh, Paris and Saint Pierre and Miquelon. Guess what? That region is only about 93 uh, square kilometers and only 6,000 people living there. So they're planning to uh, launch a uh, twice per week fly between those two uh, locations. So again, I think the region needs to sort of rethink what they should be doing. There is no better time than today to basically look at a business from top down, bottom, bottom down, and think about what else can be done and how can we attract more traffic to a region that has, you know, a beautiful uh, scenaries and it have a lot of potential in terms of social distancing, uh, community-based travel, you know, experiential travel. So the opportunity is there. The problem is how do we put all this together in a way that we work with the federal government, the uh, the local government, uh, the tourism uh, office is the official one, the local one, the airport, the airlines, and the entire end-to-end -end travel uh, industry. So if we are able, if they're able to do that today, they will be in a much better position to target those specific segments and stimulate the market in advance before, you know, after, you know, hopefully, you know, travel restrictions are lifted. And I think, you know, it's it's very much about trying to reposition. Look at look at this, uh, as Rene said, it, it, it it's the, the destination. It's all about trying to say it's it's an alternative Canada. What you know, you've got 22 million visitors and only one point some million are going. So where are, why are the other 21 million not visiting? And if you look at Spain many years ago, they had a fantastic campaign. Everybody was going to Malaga, everybody was going to Alicante, Benidorm. Nobody went to the top of Spain. And they came up with a campaign called Espana Verde, Green Spain. And, they, and it was so successful in repositioning. Don't think about Spain just because of its beach or because of, of, the, of the winter sun. The north of Spain is unique. And that Espana Verde was one of the most successful campaigns in Europe. How can Atlantic Canada do a similar concept, the alternative Canada, that tries to bring something that isn't linked to Toronto or Vancouver or the Rockies that, that most people are probably on Niagara Falls. It's about trying to think again, as Rodney Rennie was saying, it's, it's now there's, it's a white, it's a canvas, as Miguel likes to say, paint the picture. I think that yeah, yes. I think that's a very good pitch, you know, thinking green, open space, you know, some sort of like tour activities. We're talking about biking, uh, walking, you know, bird watching, you know, well watching. So the opportunity is really there for the region to basically open up and target all these uh, potential segments. I mean, another thing could be, you know, key tours where uh, such as, you know, cooking real Atlantic Canadian region food, you know, with local communities, you know, and I'll be talking about these segmentations and stimulation down the line, but basically aligned with uh, Gavin is saying and Mike is, is saying as well. I think that, you know, it's important that, you know, we, we focus in on what the international opportunities are, and I thank everybody for contributing to the international uh, opportunities in the um, You know, what is it that you think we can do? Uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't talked much about the U.S., and we definitely haven't talked anything about stimulating Canadian travel into and out of the Maritimes. And does anybody have any views about, you know, what is it that, you know, keeps Canadians um, interested in flying to the Maritimes? And is the tourism infrastructure and the airline infrastructure in place to support the extended you know, need for more Canadian tourism as we 
recover from this pandemic. Yeah, I Renee, can probably Renee? jump. Yeah, yeah, I can probably jump on that one. I mean, um, on, I mean, you have to segment the market, right? So the region. I mean, looking domestically, I see at least twelve segments, you know, and another fifteen international. You know, in in, in ways you can segment the market, and I'm I'm basically bringing you know a, a benchmark and the expertise from different part of the world, and this is what I think the region should be doing. Basically, looking outside, you know, what is being done and some sort of built. Hybrid, hybrid product. So today and going forward, as we know, it is expected that tourism may look more inwards and be more domestically directed, as you mentioned, John. So domestic tourism is and will be for a while the first opportunity to get a business back on track and will be that strategy to staying afloat and the first potential source of source of income. Remember that it's easier to control whatever is within your boundaries, you know, and, uh, and borders than outside. And potentially, you know, and, and I know people might not want to, 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 to listen to this, but we are in this for a long term and it could be potentially set back and reset. The, the, the borders could, could open soon internationally, but they could be closed again. And this is not only to happen in Canada, this would happen around the world. It happened in the UK, just to put an example. So. Consequently, I mean, as I mentioned before, the region should be thinking about niche focus, remote and upper open air products. Besides activity and experiential travel, family and sustainable travel, you know, could be some of the products that you see that they are growing gro globally. In terms of uh, meeting social distancing and measures, and especially in Europe, many are signing up for self-guided tours, and others continue preferring, you know, community-based tourism as well in remote areas. So the region has an special opportunity to target those. Likewise, and you see this especially in the US, road trips and RV living and rentals are picking up pace in many parts of the world, including the US. So does the region may have a shot with this product? I certainly believe there is an opportunity there. Besides, think on key tours such as, you know, as I mentioned before, cooking, real, Atlantic, Canada, uh, Canada region food with a local community. Think about, again, biking, walking, bird, uh, well watching. The idea will be to develop and quickly roll out products and services in your provinces and communities that can allow you to tap into a new audience and revenue stream. Finally, think about our staycations, uh, destinations. As many travelers may think twice about traveling abroad, and many Canadians might not be able to do it due to the travel restrictions and disposable income, a staycation is an opportunity to reinvigorate local businesses and traveling by car demand. People still want to go to get away, to go somewhere, you know, and forget about the worries that we are seeing today. The key point, again, in this strategy and this plan will be to include those products uh, uh, followed by a strategic project uh, pricing and marketing with or, with or without low capex opportunities and partnerships to optimize revenues. Besides, and to finish on this one, it is important to get creative by thinking about what you can do to offer those identified segments and, and, and what, what are the things that they have been missing out or have not been able to see before because of the travel restrictions. Again, today staying afloat may mean to focus on local, rural, remote and remote destinations. And indeed, there is a key opportunity for the Atlantic Canadian region, region to encourage locals, uh, Canadians to further discover their own backyards. Great, like thank you. Them. Yes, I would like to, to add here on the domestic side, if I may, um, because of my years of uh, experience, especially developing the whole region on behalf of WestJet, uh, from the beginning, even, even before WestJet operated in Atlantic Canada, I did all the studies and worked with all the teams and the governments. Atlantic Canada does an amazing, um, an amazing job when it comes to to advertising. The, the, the every single province, tourism, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island. Um, but now we are we're sitting in front of the opportunity to attract that on tap market. So I would I would just throw a number that comes out of my head and our, out of my head as always. I would tell everybody here, and I want all the people around the world to think about their own airlines, their own destination management companies, their own tour operators. 85% of all Canadians have never visited Atlantic Canada. 80% of people in Toronto, where I'm from, have never been to Atlantic Canada, even though they've always said, oh, I would like to go. 
I've heard a lot about it. I've seen videos. So this is the time to do something that islands like Malta are doing. Uh, uh, from what it looks right now, uh, Tanti Canada will continue to be a bubble during the pandemic for a while, or maybe till uh, the beginning of the summer. So if you get, a, and, I, and I give kudos to airlines, like provincial airlines have been launching flights intramaritimes, intra-Atlantic right now. How do you get people? We all want to run away from, from where we are right now because we have been told to stay put. We want to move. So if you put a flight right now from Quebec City to Newfoundland to Deer Lake and you create a story, even though you're a bubble, you could be a bubble with Quebec, you create a story, you create an incentive, you create a marketing strategy that you're able to bring to market, to tweak and twist. You can pr provide, for example, uh, a government supported incentive for the hotels to get people moving again. This is fast thinking, this is agile. This is how you're gonna get people to try an area from a domestic perspective. On the other hand, I would close with this statement. The, the, the design of an airline or transportation network and uh, it has to be laid out by the provinces, by, by a common mutual agreed uh, business and strategic plan. You need to know what you want and you need to reach out to the transportation companies. And of course, provide the infrastructure by saying, hey, I would like you to fly from here to here because of this. If the airlines come in here, if we only have one or two airlines in the area, those airlines are going to design those networks based on their cost structure needs, their business model, and their passenger flow model. The hub and spoke model is excellent for many reasons, and we airline experts know that. They, they connect Atlantic Canada to the world, but at the same time, if a region only has a 95% hub and spoke model, we have a problem for the region, for the interest of the region and the economic development of the region. Thank you. If I can just add from, from the European point, John, obviously we had a little bit of an opening, as you know, back in summer 20, and it was fascinating how the tourism boards that obviously, and I'm talking again, Portugal, Spain, France, but particularly France, they turned it around. And what they said is, look, you know, we, we're not expecting the French people to be to be leaving. So they, they came up with this wonderful com concept. They called it this summer. I visit France. Obviously, that would be translated. And it was storytelling about people jumping in a car and driving around parts of France that you would never even think about. And Spain did the same. Spain, Spain took their, their basically their global communication and put it in Spanish to tell Spanish people, haven't we got fantastic wine, fantastic cheese, fantastic beaches, but we keep going somewhere else? And they called it Discover the Unbelievable. And as Mike said, how many people haven't visited their own region? And that that's as much as trying to develop. And if you look at if you know from what Rene was saying, I think I, I just heard yesterday on a webinar by the, the guys of OAG, the two fastest growing airports in the world, or let's say the world, i.e. the US, because they're the only ones that are really been working, and China, is Bosiman, which is an airport I didn't know next to Yellowstone National Park, and Jackson Hole in Wyoming. So Montana <laughs> and Wyoming are the two fastest growing airports in the world not Los Angeles, London, or New York. And it's what? Open space, as Rene rightly said. So you've got, you've got the ability to get the domestics, and you've also got the ability that you're not cities with mass people. So it's there. It's just got to be story told, as Miguel rightly was, was saying. Well, simple to say, Gavin. I mean, I think implementation could be a little more difficult than that. <laughs> uh, and as we mentioned, you know, we're, take, we're taking questions from the, uh, from the participants. So we've got a... Uh, a couple of questions here. I think I'm going to let uh, Julia um, just kind of give us one of the questions that uh, is coming from the audience. Julia? Yes. Hello. Thank you. So we have one here. Um, so it seems uh, a large problem is with Canadians trying to visit uh, Atlantic Canada because there there's no there are no direct flights from most of the country, at least from BC, without a transit either in um, in Toronto or Montreal area. The overall total time and also the cost of air, air travel in Canada seems to uh, to make flying internationally a much more attractive destination. So that's that's one of uh, 
Anybody want to jump in on that one? Comments. Sure, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot here. Definitely because of the size of the country and the hub and spoke model operation of our two national carriers. Uh, the connections happen through Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, which take a full day to, to move around. On, on that note, the size plays a role and the pricing. But now, um, and let's look at the pandemic right now and the situation of the airlines right now. I'm sure any of the of the narrow body 737 or A320 operators in Canada would be happy to get some revenue moving or moving Canadians around the country. Let's put this scenario here. Um, in, in this new opportunity, if, if we can only travel within Canada for the next six months and the intra borders are, are, are down, so there's no restrictions to move around borders, it will be a great opportunity for the governments of the Atlantic provinces to talk to the national airliners and say, bring a flight from BC to Newfoundland twice a week, three times a, a week, and we will we will work on a program with rewards and hoteliers and the local um, hospitality industry. So we can do that six, seven hour flight. I think it's around six and a half hours just to go from Vancouver to St. John's, Newfoundland. To your point, you're totally right. It's a, it's a, it's a fairly long distance and the economics of, of a long of a long haul flight uh require require the economics so but if the government and the airlines for the next six six months build those city pairs just to get canadians moving around and trying their own country we have a business case Kevin, would, would there be an opportunity now that uh, air canada is going to be uh financially assisted you know would it be an opportunity so that kind of trips you know are incentivized are pushed without bypassing you know the help and spoke system that could be an opportunity. And again, uh, to your point, uh, Mike, as well, um, I have I have flown to the to the uh, Arctic to to, to, the, to the Arctic North. And again, how many Canadians have ever been in the Arctic North? Not that many. I mean, it's very expensive to fly there. There is not even enough competition pot potentially to be there. It is expensive to operate in those scenarios. But I think uh, through the financial assistance package, hopefully this is going to incentivize part of these uh, open air, green areas, you know, activity and flying that we're seeing in the U.S. by the U.S. carriers, but it's going to be pushed now by the government. Hopefully what I would like not to see is that those small carriers, regional carriers besides Air Canada and WestJet, that they, they were planning to launch operations, you know, in June, in May, you know, in this region, Hopefully they will not retract because now there is going to be obviously more competition, which is going to be economically or financially assisted. So that will be, uh, hopefully that won't happen at, and we see more of that open green air type of line going to the region. Kevin, yeah, any comments? Yeah, I mean, if you, yeah. if, you look, if you look south, John, if you look at two, two ultra low cost businesses that were developed, Sun Country Airlines and Allegiant, they were backed by by the private sector of hotels and 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 industries. Okay, so Allegiant, yes, it's Las Vegas. So I'm not saying that Atlantic Canada has the the type of business that Las Vegas brings. But the mentality was: look, we don't just want to be another low cost airline like Frontier that we're going to fight against. No, we need a different vision. We need to be an airline that's also a tour operator and a leisure. And we're doing we're not doing Denver, New York three times a day like a Southwest or Frontier. No, we're going to do Jackson Hole to Cincinnati twice a week. And, you know, this kind of is that not what Flair was trying to do? Or can somebody have to what can Flair do to try and bring in this ULCC model that tries to expand the projects opens up different potential, works with a tour operator, creates an in-house tour operator, gets the hotels involved. We have in the Canary Islands, there's a, there's a project just starting now, Canarian Airways. Why is Canarian Airways being developed? Because the hoteliers don't believe that the airlines are bringing enough business to the destination. So the hoteliers have got together with a regional tourism board to create an airline. Now that can be expensive. It's politics with an airline you know, we know that may not work, but the mentality is, is sometimes we've got to think differently. And what Sun Country and Allegiant were trying to do was not go in and compete with Frontier and Southwest on point to point low cost, but provide a low cost opportunity, bundle it up with packages with hotels and, and attractions. And could that be a way to bring people from the West to the East? To, to support this six hour vision. You know, it's again, all about trying to think a bit differently about what we have and what could come in and how the privates get involved in this as well. 
And I think I think that's a very good point. I think you know the question is going to be one. You know, you look at this market and basically say, you know, bring in the traffic, and we'll be able to support you know the accommodation of that traffic. The question is, have we got really an integrated approach to looking at you know providing air services and accommodation services in Atlantic Canada? Do we really have an integrated approach that the airlines talk to the tourism agencies and talk to the hotels, talk to the tour operators, talk to the surface transportation groups to make sure that whatever we do bring in, however we decide to bring them in by air with whatever carrier, is that we do have the infrastructure in place to in fact accommodate and offer you know, the, the level of accommodation that we're basically looking at offering to these international visitors or Canadian visitors. And I think, you know, I, I, I always remember my my lobster dinners on North Rustico in PEI, where you know the family, you know, my, my mom and dad and the four of us, four kids, you know, we basically were 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 in a hotel in downtown Charlottetown uh, because we couldn't find a hotel room close to North Rustico, and it, it really was, you know, and that and that was many years ago, uh, but it really, you know, that stuck in my mind, saying that you know the infrastructure that's in place to accommodate if we decide to fly. You know, three or four times a week, a seven eight seven from Paris to Moncton or Paris to Charlottetown. You know, is is the infrastructure in that community and those communities around it able to support the level of demand that we're being created by bringing those operations in there? So rather than just throwing capacity, it has to be a negotiated level of capacity that the infrastructure is able to support. I think we just can't let the door go wide open. It's got to be a coordinated, integrated, and limited development of the product. Any comment? Good job. That's why I'm, you know, I, from my side on on the on the European picture, you know, British Airways, you know, Air France, KLM, SAS, they're not going to fly into St. John. No, not not at the moment. The, the businesses are in turmoil. We know that. You know what's been happening over in our side of Europe with the government bailout and the governments now route development. The whole project for an airline is. The business case analysis to open something like that is not going to happen. So we've got to go, as you rightly said, go more seasonal, look at working with tour operators, guaranteeing flights in a different way. And I don't, I'm not looking for four flights per week to Moncton, but you could easily have, you know, twice a week, once a week and start building that up and do a fly drive program with one tour operator. Another tour operator does a, you know, a, a, a combined two stay visit. And, you know, that, this is all about bringing the trade to the desk, to the table and opening up that discussion. And as I said, don't chase supply. Don't just throw revenue guarantees at airlines. Yeah, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it anymore because the board is going to say, sorry, we can't justify losing money anymore. So it's got to be profitable or we're not going to do it. And if we do I, a revenue I, guarantee, the tour operators turn around and say, well, where's the money for promotion? Oh, sorry, we gave it all to the airline. And let me just uh, quickly add something in here. Let's move away from tourism and inbound tourism. And I invite everybody to think about human behavior, our personal behavior, our mental health, our way of living uh, as consequence of COVID. So for those international attendees in other countries of the world that are not extremely familiar with Canada, our population lives in four cities, mainly. 85% of our population. I like that 85%. I don't know if I'm right or no, but please quote me or send me a note after this event. I'm totally fine with that. But we have trouble uh, keeping the population staying in certain provinces and gorgeous areas in Canada. So as part of economic development, we need our populations, people to move to those areas. Throughout the years, we have tried a lot of Torontonians to move to Atlantic Canada. I'm a Toronto person. No, I won't move to, to Atlantic Canada. It's too far or it's here or it's that. But today, me, and I'm just using a personal example. I'm thinking about selling my house in Toronto and buy a place in Prince Edward Island. I, I'm heavily thinking about it. On that note, this is an opportunity to also attract those people who can now work remote, move to all of their different areas. They want to change their lifestyle. And this is economic development. For economic development to happen, there has to be transportation from sea, land, and air. So what a great opportunity right now for Atlantic Canada to attract new inhabitants to the region, uh, people moving their offices or their corporations to other areas of the country. But in order for that to be successful, we need to have a layer of multiple air service providers called national airlines, 
charter airlines, international airlines, and intra-regional airlines, supra-regional airlines for this to be successful. So um, another, another thought out there. Rene, any comments? Yeah, I mean, what I think is that, I mean, again, you have, you have, you have, you need to look at the world, what is happening and what could be some sort of implemented as a hybrid product in the region. I mean, how about, you know, loyalty program and, you know, and vaccinate vacation campaigns, you know, you know, one example is the, the, the Maldives, you know, which has basically rolled out a loyalty program in addition through what they call a 3V tourism initi initiative. The 3V stand for visit vaccine and vaccination campaign. So, uh, the country has basically put together a, 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 a frequent flyer program to encourage repeat visit by tourism. This is a key and a joint initiative between the Maldives Immigration, the Ministry of, of, of Tourism, the Maldives Marketing Arm, and even the airport got involved in this one. So it's similar to a loyalty program, for the ones that airlines and airport have. So can something like this be developed as a as an own reward and loyalty program in the region? Potentially, yes. I mean, can additionally can additional points based on the number of visit done be awarded for visitors to celebrate a special occasions such as birthday, weddings, you know, or it, or even border cr uh, crossing, you know, when 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 uh, the restrictions are lifted. I mean, another one that we have to consider is that today the largest CD pair in the world in terms of capacity, seat capacity or capacity put in the market is between the US and uh, Mexico. And why is that? Because basically that is favoring, you know, uh, uh, I mean, both the US and the Mexican carriers are expecting to continue and strategically to increase that number of seat supply because there is an issue about vaccination logistics in Latin America. Not only that, many countries today in Latin America are seeing, are flying to the US to be vaccinated. I mean, what can this happen some sort of to combine some sort of like a like a vacation vaccination campaign in the Atlantic region? Potentially, yes. I mean, obviously, the uh, the vaccination program in Canada needs to be rolled out, uh, you know, stronger than the one that is going today for hopefully this to happen. But this trend is expected to continue and airline seat capacity is expected to reach pre-pandemic level between the U.S. and Mexico by this June. So is this an opportunity that can be uh, further exploring the region? Potentially, yes. And Latin Americans will continue flying to the U.S. to get free shots, free vaccines, because we have many issues in that region uh, regarding logistic and vaccination. And only about 33% of the population in Chile has received just only one shot, and the one following is Brazil with only 5%. Five, 5%. Five so this is an opportunity to target Latin America into Canada, into the uh, Atlantic region, uh, uh, Atlantic um, Canadian region as well. Great. Julia, we have any more questions coming from the floor? Yes, we do. So one of, uh, of our attendees believes that there, there's a lot of uh, Canadians who are still concerned with the provincial and federal restrictions uh, regarding COVID-19. So what's your answer to this? I can jump in if you want. Yeah, I can jump in. I mean, obviously, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, you know, in the next perhaps two to three years, you know, traveling is going to be looking more in war and more domestics. So uh, one of the things the government and the federal government and the province could do about this is uh, they need to rethink how to stimulate demand. And I observe a number of ways that this can be, can be done. One of the things is about a tourism voucher program. For example, if you look in countries like Poland, Croatia, Slovenia, Singapore, and even Argentina, they have already adopted a, frame, a framework to stimulate demand. Uh, to basically, uh, they have launched a national voucher system to encourage, encourage citizens of these countries to take domestic overnight trips, you know, eat at a restaurant or exchange the voucher for other tourism related activities. This is something that I encourage the Atlantic Canadian region to consider. Another one is the advanced purchase credit program, which is another strategy, a strategy where buyers receive a credit equivalent of up to 
for example, 50% of their purchase made to spend across the tourism sector. Another strategy is gift certificates and early beer, prom uh, early beer promotions should be considered. Furthermore, you have to look into the hygiene and cleaning certification. And in that case, for example, the tourism of Portugal created a clean and a safe certificate that recognize companies in the tourism sector that comply with the minimum hygiene and cleaning requirements for the prevention and control of COVID-19. It was developed in conjunction with the Portuguese uh, health department. And this is very important. And why? Because, you know, there is, a, if you're trying to forecast demand today, there are more than 40 variables impacting demand today. And guess what? One of the ones that is the most uncontrollable one is the fears and anxieties to travel. Therefore, the end-to-end -end travel chain from airports, uh, um, airlines, official and local tourism governments, the private sectors, hotels, restaurants, etc., need to work together to identify and diminish those fears and, and anxieties. In addition, in addition, you will have partnerships and alliances. It's another way to stimulate a strategy, and that will jumping uh, comes in the, the private sector, especially when many businesses need to preserve liquidity and contain costs today. Another strategy will be establishing long weekends or moving national holidays close to a weekend, either a Friday or a Monday, to incentivize domestic travel within a country. For example, Costa Rica approved a law to move all the holidays in 2020 and 2021 to Mondays in order for Costa Ricans to enjoy long weekends to travel domestically, extend their stay at the hotels, and contribute to the recovery of the economy. And finally, other strategies will include implementing additional holidays to boost tourism spending, hospitality, loyalty programs, such as the one that I just explained, uh, implemented by many countries, in, including the Maldives, provincial and, and government fiscal incentives, for example, tax deferrals, tax holidays, and tax reductions. Those are some of the strategies that the region could use to boost uh, domestic travel. Thanks, Renee. Thank yes, uh, yes, just very, very quickly here, I will just add something. And to all my friends in Atlantic Canada, I hope everybody's staying safe. There was an article on the Global Mail uh, yesterday afternoon, and it was, I think it was the Global Mail, um, but it was actually an admiration of the good work you've done as a community and as a region, reducing the risk of COVID in the area how the community has worked together and open and closed the bubble internally. So you have kept the economy going internally while keeping the borders for the rest of Canada closed. Uh, the point here become at some point, this is a fluid situation. The, the four of us here, we're not going to give you the answer. Nobody knows, but at some point, uh, the borders will have to come down. So the point becomes, how do we get to travel again? So if that first step is a vaccine passport, a Canadian vaccine card, and Atlantic Canada opens for inbound domestic tourism, then, then it is what it is. The vaccine card will be, become a safer, because there's no, no, not total safety these days, nowhere in the world. It will be a safer way to allow other fellow Canadians, step one, to enter the provinces. If the next step will be Americans coming back to Canada and our borders reopen on our side, then some sort of CDC card to allow these airlines to start business, to start being able to bring Americans, reunite families, and third phase will be international. So the whole world is looking for ways to do it safely, uh, the same way that cruise liners, for example, that's a good analogy. They're trying to restart. So we need to bear in mind as a group that at some point, we will need to restart. We're humans, we're resilient, but we need to have those uh, that thinking process that enables a safe and a reimagined um, restart and a more successful one for uh, for different places in the world. Great, Gavin. Maybe maybe the, the, the Britishness in me. I, I'm a, I'd like to be a bit more positive. I mean, did, I've just found out that in 2021, there'll be 1,000, roughly at the moment, there's about 1,400 new routes have been created. It's the most ever in history. Yep. So a lot of the world believes that we're going forward and there's a lot of opportunities. If you're not on that train, the train is getting out of the station quite quickly. Yep. Of course, yep. we just don't know. And of course, I'm not saying let's be gang-ho and, and, and the virus doesn't exist. Absolutely not. But there is a pent-up demand that is huge out there. And we've got to be ready for it because it's 
it's going to happen at the end of 2019. I was working a lot with the Chinese and you probably remember that, sorry, 2018, moving into 2019, it was the fastest growing outbound market in the world. 800 million Chinese outbound tourists and everybody in Europe, every capital city in Europe wanted the Chinese. Of course, that's on hold, but we know they're coming back. We know they're coming back and people are getting ready for them coming back. So I think, you know, we've got to we've got to be careful. But we've also got to think about, you know, we, we, we're going to get through this and what's yep. going to be on the other side. Otherwise, you know, I said 1400 new routes and only 400 of those are in China and America. So there's still a thousand in the rest of the world. And I think that's a, that's an important element to understand is that, you know, the, the, the industry is not sitting back and waiting for vaccines or waiting for consensus on passports and census on testing and all that. That's going to still take us a few months before we get there, notwithstanding, you know, um, Mr. Johnson's approach to the green uh, lists in the, uh, in the UK. But I think that it's important to understand that, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, will in fact still be with us for a few more months. And I, and I think it's time that, you know, while we may not be able to open all our borders and maybe the travel bubbles, may not be necessarily in place, but that should not stop planners from the actually thinking and really taking action to in fact, you know, create those products, create those relationships and start planning those new routes, as you've just said, the 1400 in the world that are being created. How many of those 1400 are Canadian, have a Canadian origin or destination? I would suggest not many. And I, and I think that's where we, you know, we need to get, you know, off the ground to basically start working on potentially looking at new routes and new linkages that are out there that can basically support the growth that we expect in these Atlantic markets. Uh, I think we've got, we've got, sorry, John, just, just on that, as you know, yeah. I mean, you've been in the industry as well, the pl planning of, I think tour operators are worse than airlines. They're, they're working about 15 months in advance. Airlines is one year. Airlines now don't even know what's going to be summer IATA here in Europe. That's, you know, that's, all, we have yeah, no we're, idea. We're, we're all working with a very short planning horizon. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Correct. And that's what yeah. that's what we're talking about here is network experimentation. Just try it. We've got nothing to lose in some cases. Yeah. I know. Correct. You know, the next question from the audience, I think, is going okay, to be a, an interesting one. So, Julia. So the next question is, uh, it has been <laughs> mentioned several times, but by different panelists, that if the government dot dot dot, it could be an opportunity. Is this a code for there's only an opportunity if government subsidize new air service between regions? No, I, I, I may take the first okay. shot here if, if okay. you don't mind. Uh, no, I, I, I don't agree with, uh, with just always relying or chasing or accusing uh, the government for that purpose. We are, uh, we are a country of entrepreneurs. We're a country of private investors. So there is, there is investors all across Canada. This is an opportunity to get investors who maybe have never explored the aviation business. This is an opportunity to start one, two or three regional airlines based out of Atlantic Canada, Quebec or Ontario and do things in a different way. I do provide consulting companies to wealth management in New York. And the past five months, there's been a, a lot of uh, calls made uh, to me uh, and, and it's airlines. There is fleet out there. There's airplanes. Airplanes are cheap. Unfortunately, many operators went belly up. So this is an, an opportunity to create, to create from new, to use fresh money to restart or start something completely um, ours. Ours uh, to have a, not only one airline in Atlantic Canada, but two or three regionals. And I'm not talking about having 10 or 20 and tell the government to pay for it. That's uh, that's to sit comfortably in the couch and just wait for the government. My my invitation here, and it's a friendly one, is to say, why not? Why don't I start a tour operator based out of New Brunswick? Why, as a 25-year-old with five friends of mine, millennials, that are local Newfoundlanders, I don't start something new. And I just escalate, elevate, and advance uh, a new business. That would make sense. 
Rene, what do yeah, you think? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I agree with Mike. I mean, one of the things that obviously people will be looking at, you know, uh, from, from the potential investor side will be to see what kind of uh, fiscal incentive, you know, or what kind of incentive they can get in terms of, you know, uh, deferral in taxes and whatever, or even, you know, besides looking at job creation, creation tax reductions, you know, that, that, that should be something important. I mean, we need to incentivize competitiveness in the country, you know, we need to look beyond of what is happening today, and this is a key opportunity to do that. So I would say if you can align that entrepreneurial mindset with key uh, fiscal incentive, you know, it's going to be a, an easier way to push that innovation and that execution. I mean, we, we read uh, last week there is another carrier planning to open at Beach, Bishop International Airport flying Dutch 400 from uh, that airport to the US and basically targeting a uh, premium uh, passenger segment. So that's an opportunity. We saw another one in the US, another ULCC just basically open doors, just going to those niche open air, you know, green areas destination. So there is an opportunity, there is, there is 30. There is no better time than today to uh, start a new carrier. Why? Because there are pilots available, leases, aircraft leases are, are, are way down from compared, you know, to a, a 14 month, month ago. And there is many people looking at opportunities. A every challenge, uh, you know, present opportunities as it is. So you will see more traction in new startups coming out of the market, basically as uh, full service carriers are retrenching to their hubs. They are basically restructuring their business. And this opened the door for a small niche, regional, low cost, low cost some operators to basically open shop and, uh, you know, take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I wrote an article um, recently where I, dis I mean, I, I've, I've sat on both sides. I've, I've, I've been a CCO of an airline, so I've negotiated with airports. I've negotiated with tourism and I'm the advisor to a tourism board. So I've, I've had airlines come to me and I wrote my article. If I, if I remember going back to roots events pre pandemic, the 1st question an airline would ask is how much money do you have? Post pandemic, the 1st question an airline is how can we work together to reduce risk? Why would I throw money at an airline? Sorry. Why, why incentivize supply? I need to incentivize demand. If demand is there, people will travel. If I'm just going to pay airlines to fly to, to fill an airport, it doesn't make sense. And I'm not going to mention an airline, but there's been a lot of that in the Caribbean, particularly with airlines coming from the UK and Germany. They've gone into the Caribbean islands on revenue guarantees and the tour operators have turned around and said, well, where's the money for us? There's nothing left. We gave everything to the airline. We incentivized mm -hmm. an airline to fly but they didn't do any promotion because they're a scheduled airline. They're not a tour operator friendly airline. They're not working very well with, with allotments and commitments. So just putting money into aviation, it's short term. It's short term. You need a vision to work it up and build that vision together. And yeah, airlines that's today, it's about reduced risk, not how much money you have. It's smart investing. You gotta invest in the right channel to make sure that you are in fact generating return for that investment. Um, I think, Mark, you know, and I'm just going to go back to the, to the services and the Maritimes for a few minutes. Just talk about the events that happened this week in Ottawa with the uh, financing deal that happened between Air Canada and the government and the commitment by Air Canada to uh, reinstate uh, regional routes that they that they had abandoned or suspended, I should say, uh, over the last few months. Uh, and a significant number of those routes have been in Atlantic Canada. And the question is always asked, you know, so... What, you know, what services have been put in place or plan to be put in place by other carriers to replace Air Canada? And I think there's been a number of carriers that have stepped up to the plate, uh, including my, you know, my buddies over at PAL, uh, you know, who, who've taken the effort and made, made the, the announcements of reinstating or, or creating new linkages uh, across the planet Canada. Uh, and now, you know, the question is going to be asked of Air Canada and of the, the marketplace does Air Canada reinstate those services back into those markets to create the linkages that were suspended? Or do they basically have to work with the regional carriers that have replaced them to, in fact, look at developing commercial agreements, supplement and help those regional services survive and not really fly, you know, Air Canada metal into that, into that region or any region in Canada that has you know, made efforts to try to get replacement carriers. And I just want to throw that out to you in terms of your thoughts about you know, what should Air Canada or how should Air Canada approach 
um, you know, the, the reinstatement of some of these major reserves. Renee uh, or go Mike? Ahead. Yeah, Mike, go first. Go first. Okay. Um, great topic. And there's there's a there's a, there's some news this morning in Quebec where regional operator Pascan just announced an agreement with Air Canada, an independent uh, operator. So uh, this is a hot potato. And this is a hot potato because we love our national airlines. We need them. But the Canadian regional markets, the smaller cities in Canada, the Sudbury's, the Deer Lake, the Gander, the Bathurst, New Brunswick, uh, the Charlottetown, uh, they're, sometimes they're seasonal. It's very hard to make money in those markets, but we need to connect them to the global network. I think uh, uh, Minister Omar, from a transportation perspective, and, and the Trudeau government and our future governments, we need to understand that regional flying is the foundation of a successful Canada. And, and, and we should not allow to have exclusive agreements that actually create monopolies into a city pair, a region, or a duopoly. Because even duopolies in certain city pairs are not financially viable. The moment you have a duopoly or a monopoly in a city pair in Canada, there's no room for a competitor. And if there's no competition, there's no room for growth, for opportunity for the region, and the pricing goes through the roof. Somebody mentioned in the chat, it's more expensive to fly across Canada. Yes, it is. I did a very recent uh, turnaround of an airline. I was doing a lot of revenue analysis. So what the Canadian government should do is encourage the creation of more regional airlines and force them to interline without exclusive commitments with the national carriers. That would enable a flare, that would enable a transat, that would enable a transat to, to also connect traffic and create new city pairs, creating innovation and new connectivity. On that note, uh, people say yes, but the systems and the technology, that's not true. We're in 2021 and you can use all kinds of third parties and actually, without saying names, because these are about marketing product, we have a great company in Canada based out of Atlantic Canada that enables distribution for airlines globally without entering all these exclusive agreements. So why not explore what we have and have two or three airlines regionals connect to the main national carriers and, and they can negotiate their pricings and whatever and the, the amount of uh, the, how, how did the relationship go but interline versus exclusive relationships. The regional airlines need to control their destinies and their own revenues. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, I, I basically agree. I agree with that. I mean, interlining should be the way to go. Uh, we need to promote more competition, not less competition. I mean, yes. if you want to benefit the the, the, the the customer, you need to have more choices. And again, I think the Canadian government should be helping through fiscal incentives to allow for further competition to come in. Because remember, everybody uh, is willing to pitch in, to look into new opportunities and invest the money, but they don't want a lot of capacity to be dumped into them and basically uh, have no business to, to go to, to go forward. So having an exclusivity agreement is not the best way to go. It should be opening the door for other players to come. And if Canada really as a government wants to have all this community to be served, they need to encourage more competition in the industry. But at the price of an Air Canada coming in and pushing out a regional carrier? No, I would say, you know, interlining will be a great opportunity to do that. You know, that will be the best way to go. And, you know, through difficult uh, fiscal incentive, you know, the government could potentially encourage, you know, entrepreneurship into new potential, uh, you know, business model to be, uh, to be having the country. Okay. Mike? Interesting from, from, a benchmark across here in Europe, it's completely different than Air France's support because the, the French government said you can't do any regional flying. So Rick, for the opposite reason, they want to they want to push SNCF and get people on the train and not flying between Lyon and, 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 and Paris, etc. So obviously the distances in Canada are too great and you don't have a train service the same way. But the reality is, is that, of course, what you're doing is it's politics, isn't it? Because you're supporting the, 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 the bailout or the loan to the national airline, but you've got to also then ask them to do something. And in this case is do things that help these regions, because obviously we're talking a little about inbound tourism and that's not part of this 
wider project, having flights between Air Canada into these regions is not for inbound tourism, as Mike rightly said at the start. That's not helping international inbound. It might help some domestic inbound, but I think it's you know it's it's inevitable that if a government's going to help the airline, they've got to have some sort of reason for that support. And in this way, they've said, okay, you have to go back and help regions on behalf of us as. The, the the federal government, uh, you know, interesting. Say Air France went the other way and said, yes, you can have this money, but don't fly regional. Right. And I, I'll just uh, and I totally agree with that. And I'm just going to make a, a small joke in here. I see a couple of comments there going like, oh, Mike is being blunt. Let's be blunt. Let's not do the same we've done for the past forty years. It's 2021, so we can do things in a different way. Uh, we're for for those from all uh, from other countries. Just think about the following. Uh, domestic travel in Canada from the most eastern point to the most western point in Canada, it's a seven and a half hour nonstop flight. <laughs> We're second in size uh, fall, uh, just after Russia in terms of size. Aviation is not a luxury in Canada. Aviation is not a, a privilege for some. Aviation, uh, it's how Canada moves around. Uh, we are very far from, you cannot drive from Halifax to Vancouver to see your cousin. That would be like 10 days and stopping in 12 motels. So how we look at the future of aviation for Atlantic Canada is how we look at the future of aviation for the whole country. Yeah, and I think, I think that, you know, you, you know, you've all mentioned, you know, the role that the government, you know, could, should, might play. In, in, in protecting regional services and the question is going to be one of saying how much government involvement, how much government influence should we now have in looking at, you know, protecting regional carriers and regional routes. And I think, you know, that's going to be the big question that's going to be asked in the marketplace over the next little while is that does Air Canada withhold its services from, you know, it's running Air Canada metal, as I call it into some of these regional markets they have had before, which have been replaced by smaller regional carriers. And that when the Air Canada metal shows up, you know, these guys basically have to get out of the market because the market can't support Air Canada metal and regional carrier services. So, you know, it's gonna be an interesting uh, evolution of the return of Air Canada and how it decides to return into those markets. Um, exclusive interline agreements, interesting. Uh, and I think that's what they're doing with Air Pascan, with Pascan to serve Eastern Quebec. So they did the Madeleine and Gaspé, yeah, Gaspé yep. and all of those places. It looks like Pascan is going to be the interline provider, interline, you know, the sole interline Partner, provider yeah. for those services. So I'm not sure how they're going to deal with PAL in the Maritimes that PAL now has stepped in and do another budget services. It's like still going to be exclusive. And I, I think our friends over at WestJet. Uh, may may take a may you know may not be as happy in terms of watching these exclusive agreements take place and then make traffic flow on Air Canada again. So it's going to be an interesting yeah. battle to see how it's going to evolve. All yeah, right. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, last just, round. Yeah. Of, last last round of comments before we have to close. Mike, any more? Any last comments? Um, this is a time. This is a time to to look uh, at network from a different perspective. Um, I did a couple of. Uh, studies in 2019 in my previous role at a regional airline and, and um, very proud to have worked with a great team uh, innovative um, uh, professionals there but um, there's an opportunity to create virtual regional airline networks that connect to each other having a common reservation system that it, that most of them have right now most of the airlines are right now uh, owned most of the regionals have investment by canadian companies um, Either you have all these different brands, you have a virtual brand, but we need the, the small regions, whether it's Atlantic Canada, Manitoba or Saskatchewan, to have not one, but three or four carriers connecting in different directions. Um, ownership from foreign carriers increased to 49%, if I'm not wrong, a couple of years ago or two or three years ago. So there's an opportunity to have Canada more linked to US airliners that don't have a partner in Canada, to European airliners, to Asian airliners, and why not Latin carriers coming with her, uh, on a seasonal basis. So uh, that whole mentality of having this exclusive code share agreements just to protect WestJet or Air Canada and have a duopoly, 
uh, we need to work and be 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 more blunt and direct about it. But we need, okay. we, need we need a healthy a healthy aviation. Great, Gavin, you got one minute. I think you know. I'm looking at the international side. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Not on the Canada side, obviously, as my colleagues. So I think certainly, internationally, the U.S. I, I said some. You know, look at Milwaukee. Some countries based in Milwaukee, Prince Edward Island. Could it not become the new Martha's Vineyard for Americans? Why yes. not? Why not? As an opportunity, go into Europe and talk to some of the tour operators in the U.K., Germany, Scandinavia. As Mike even said, go even to southern Mediterranean countries. Think about how we work together to support lift or the canaries are done with the hoteliers together. You know, it, I think it's it's not about going after the BAs of the world and the Air France's of the world. It's going into a second level, going down. And even what about Contransat? What can Transat do in this? Yes. How can they start looking at potentially working with tour operators in Europe to come in the other way? I know out of Portugal, they did obviously a lot of Portuguese diaspora were going backwards and forwards between Porto and Toronto and Transat had a big tour operation mm -hmm. to support that. So, you know, in some of these markets, you know, we don't, we forget about Transat and they could okay. be an opportunity. Great. Sorry, Thank you. Thank you. Renee, you got a minute. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, you know, talking about, you know, the recovery and uh, talking more about the tourism sector, you know, obviously, you know, even airlines, you know, we, they have to expect what I call the six star rule and they need to work on those to, uh, to, to, to strengthen their recovery. You know, that will be, we're expecting many resets and, and setbacks. So you have to reset the business. You have to rethink the business. You have to right side the business and you will have to readjust it and you have to plan for multiple efficient restart while you learn how the demand is behaving and how you know markets are coming online or not therefore as well and in order to boost demand a bare minimum strategy should be in place one that is focusing obviously on health and safety you know beside high hygiene standard and protocols but in order to positively boost sales it also needs to focus on commercial bus boosters that diminish those fears to travel identified before. Besides those health related messages, commercial boosters should uh, be uh, should include those like refund guarantees, waiving uh, fees, date fees, and booking flexibility need to be in place as they are key for customer to book travel. Therefore, waiving fees is not only a clever strategy for customers who need extra flexibility and peace of mind, but it also is a great attempt to boost public confidence, which we need today, is strengthen future bookings and sales. Great. Thank you, Renee. Well, gentlemen, it's been an interesting afternoon, evening for some, and I think that uh, we've done a, a pretty good job of trying to understand and try to kind of lay out what a uh, structure could look like for a restart in Atlantic Canada. So we've got lots of ideas, lots of challenges, and I just wanted to thank you one more time uh, for participating and uh, just to make everybody feel comfortable that, uh, you know, the, the, this will be a video that we'll be producing and sending out uh, and posting over the next uh, couple of days so that you will have a chance to replay and to listen to some of these comments and some of these wonderful suggestions for the next little while. So. Before we let go, I just thought I'd spend a couple of minutes here to talk to you about you know, why uh, McGill is uh, doing this work and trying to position the future of aviation. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm a coordinator of the Diploma in, in, in Integrated Aviation Management, the program that we have at McGill that you know, takes people who have an undergraduate degree and provides them with an overview of what it is that's facing the challenges of aviation not just airlines, not just airports, but the whole of aviation. And what we try to do is try to help people understand the complexity associated with, you know, aviation integration and making sure that they have enough information about the various components of aviation, be it regulatory, be it economic, be it financial, be it operational, and try to make sure that we, these individuals that come to these courses and come into this program are able to really understand the, the uh, structure of those programs. My phone. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so I'll be, I'm going to pass it on. To, if you need some information around the program, uh, I think it'd be very, you know, we'll be sending out emails to everybody to kind of get everybody an, an understanding of what the program is all about and how it works and what you can do to apply to the program. And I'd like you just to pass it on to Emily to talk a bit about our career and transit and transaction and transition services uh, capability and the programs that they offer at uh, the School of Continuing Studies. Emily, over to you. Thank you, John. 
Uh, hi everyone, my name is Emily. I'm the, one of the career advisors in the Career Advising and Transition Services Office at the School of Continuing Studies. Uh, we call ourselves CATS for short. And CATS is really the career services unit at the School of Continuing Studies that's open to all School of Continuing Studies students, alumni, and potential students. And we offer career-related activities, events, resources, and a supportive network. So as advisors, we help students have clear career goals, recognize their value, their skill sets for really a successful job transition or career development and growth really at any point of their career journey. So our services include uh, individual advising and coaching sessions where we talk about job, navigating the job markets, focusing on your specific profile, resume, cover letter, and all sorts of other topics. I'll just speed through it. Uh, soft skills training sessions. So these are really intensive workshops that are designed to prepare you to clarify your unique value proposition, how to ace your elevator pitch, how to help you make the best connections during networking events, which is definitely happening these days. It's just, of course, happening mostly online. Uh, we have lots of community exchange through social media platforms, and I'll uh, let you know how you can stay connected to us. We provide internships and strategic volunteering uh, initiatives as well, virtual networking events. Uh, we have had a collaboration, we have now a collaboration with 10,000 Coffees, a data-driven networking and mentorship platform. So designed to connect mentees with mentors with similar interests. Uh, and we provide, you know, we, we, we host platforms for recruitment events. We recently had Traffic Tech, Levio, and all sorts of uh, other companies, as well as the Procurement Government of Canada. Uh, and we host other other sorts of initiatives. So if there's one thing for you to take away, it's that CATS is here for you to support you with your lifelong career management uh, skills. And we help you with the tools to really thrive in the labor market. So stay connected to us. We have the CATS Corner newsletter where you can stay connected and learn about all of our activities, events, career development tips, um, upcoming uh, workshops, and career opportunities from employers and community partners. Thank you so much, and we look forward to meeting you. Thank you, Emily. Much appreciated. All right, so that'll be for it. That'll be it for today for our session. I'll just pass it back to Julia, and uh, thank you very much for participating for a very, very engaging chat. I'm sorry we didn't get to uh, more questions, but this is a complicated issue, a complicated <laughs> subject, and lots of different inf different pieces of information that hopefully all of our panelists have been able to share with you. So until we do the next session, have a great afternoon, have a great evening, and Julia, over to you. Thank you, John. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining our webinar. Just a friendly reminder that we'll We'll be sharing the recording of this session shortly, within uh, 24 hours, and you're very welcome to contact us uh, via our website, and I put all uh, various information about CATS and our mediation programs in our chat, as well as our email for contact, so just let us know if you have any questions, and thank you very much for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.